the title of my presentation is Let There Be Light, as I worked at in Bonner Fleming's lab, uh, and I mainly worked on light detection. So Bonner Fleming's lab is part of the consortium of the Dune experiment, cool name I know, the Andy Rell neutrino experiment. It's an experiment whose general purpose is, is to assess neutrino properties and neutrino oscillation, but you might wonder what is a neutrino. I don't know either. A neutrino is a subatomic part belonging to, uh, well, particle belonging to a family of fermions. It has no electrical charge, which makes it very hard for neutrinos to be started. Also, when they interact, they do interact very rarely. And when they do, it's mainly through wick interactions or gravitational forces. Also, we have three different flavors of neutrinos, mu neutrinos, tau neutrinos, and electronic, uh, electron neutrinos. And it seems that they can, neutrinos can actually be able to switch flavors and that process is called neutrino oscillation. And that would be the main focus of the Dune experiment. So as you can see here, we have pretty big sizes as this is the surface of, her, of Earth. And basically what they're gonna do at Fermilab, they're gonna shoot a neutrino beam that will travel all the way to South Dakota, it was going to travel a distance of 300 kilometers, which is crazy. And we have two detectors, our near and a far detectors. In the lab, we focus mainly on the near detector. You can see here, the QVC here is actually a liquid argon run time projection chamber. Here you have a display of what a liquid argon time projection chamber work like. Basically, when a neutrino or a muon interact with an atom of argon, two phenomenon are going to take place, scintillation and ionization. Scintillation meaning the emission of light, hence my title, and ionization meaning electrons will be freed and thanks to the application of an electric field, uh, electrons will shift. Here, this is a charge readout, electrons will be detected and it's a time projection chamber, meaning we we're gonna be able to build a 3D trajectory of the particle after interaction has happened. That is possible thanks to our ability to actually say how, how much time it took the electron to actually uh, be detected uh, by the charge readout. That is possible because we have the time zero thanks to the light detection system. So this is a picture of the price that at a lab this is a section of the cryostat, and what you see here is basically the simple cube, which is a prototype of the near detector, the thing I showed you earlier. And this that you can see here is the arc light. But as I was saying, this, this time projection chamber is a dense time projection chamber. What does that mean? It means that we're using liquid argon. But how do we keep liquid argon liquid and around a given temperature and pressure? We use flow control. Slow controls are readout that are able to monitor the regulatory process, uh, well, yes, processes of temperature and pressure and liquid level of liquid argon. So I included some pictures of some key components here, temperature sensors, in particular RTDs, a pressure gauge, and the Arduino device, which is a device that's able to interface all the different sensor, sensors and the computer. And it, uh, and it also did that by creating a light view main display who makes the whole thing very, very easy to access. One thing about slow control is that not only do they help to keep the pressure and the level of liquid, liquid argon steady, but they're also implemented with a negative feedback who is able to uh, maintain liquid argon pressure and temperature stable. But you might wonder what RTDs are. So RTDs are resistive temperature detectors. One is, is basically, as you can see here, a wire of metal, usually copper, that is coated with an insulative material. And what they do is they use the linear relation between resistivity and temperature. Resistivity can be defined as the ability of a material to oppose a certain resistance to the flow of current. Basically saying, by, by knowing how much resistance a material is applying, we can deduct the temperature at which the RTD is working through this linear relation. I worked on RTDs, uh, more specifically we run a calibration experiment. We used, uh, this is the setup which was actually set up by Prashu, one of my co-workers along with Matt, who was here. And what we did, uh, we used a nice little cooler only because the melting point, we used the melting point of water to calibrate against and then the RTDs because it's of course a uh, very, it's accessible temperature and a lab. 
Uh, and we also use a thermometer to measure the actual temperature of water to make sure that the RTDs were no other consistent, consistent with each other were also accurate. What we're looking for exactly was consistency and accuracy. So it turned out that, all, as you can see there, temperature over 24 RTDs, it's a graph that Mackin plotted. Uh, all of the RTDs were roughly giving the same measurements, meaning they were consistent with each other, but sadly they were not accurate. But, so we thought it was on the RTDs, but we eventually, probably eventually found out that it was, the whole inaccurate thing was a problem of the Arduino, who was reading 0 0.1, 0 0.15 volts less than it should. So we were able to add a rough correction to the Arduino code, which sort of make things better, but the ability of the Arduino to read the actual temperature from the RTDs, the RTDs is still very limited. As I said, Liquid argon temperature chamber neutrino interaction sort of contemplates two different uh, phenomena: ionization, of which, uh, which I took on earlier, and light and scintillation, so the emission of photons. I also worked on the light detection system. So what the light detection system is, is basically a combination of different devices that are able to spot and detect photons produce a signal, amplify it, and computize it so that we can extract, approve, filed, and, where, and, and assess the data through, for, for example, graph, graph plotting and curve spittings. The key components of the light detection system are the arc light, the SIPM or multi-pixel photo counter that Tiziana also mentioned, and a multi-channel from an endpoint for second readout. I'll start with the arc light that you can see here. So the arc light is a pretty cool device that is able to detect light over large areas with a PDE, a photon detection efficiency of a few percent. What's cool about the arc light is that it can be used in electric field and its dielectric feature or well, structure allows it to be put in an electric field without its functionality being effective. But what does the arc light do? It detects lights, especially photons, UV photon from argon interaction, and it shifts the wavelengths so it can track them, so that can be read by the SIPM. The, the four signal you can see uh, plays right here. Um, it does so thanks to its structure. It has three different layers, uh, a 4AM uh, wavelength shifter with reflective film, so decoy film is transparent in blue and reflective in green, and a dull electric specular reflected for you with a 98% reflectance in the visible spectrum. So I was talking about SIPM. So SIPM, a uh, multi-pixel multi photo counter, is the device that is able to produce the light signal. <coughs> so what a SIPM is, is a rectangular array of pixels assembled in parallel. What a pixel is, is the combination of a quenching resistor and an APD, an avalanche photodiode. You can see here the equivalent circular non PD photodiode. It's the one that actually detects the light, produces a signal of, from the light, and it can be find, found in two different statuses. The Geiger mode, or the light-sensitive mode, and the setting mode. The Geiger mode has three diff four different features. As you can see, the switch is open, the capacitance junction uh, is charged by its voltage, the bias voltage exceeds the breakdown voltage, and no current is flowing. What's peculiar about the unsteady um, status is that a photon can easily disturb um, the whole the whole setup, meaning that once once the photos disturb the setup, current will stop flowing and the signal will be produced. But every MPPC <laughs> is able to detect in multiple events, so that's why we need a quenching resistor. The quenching resistor will be able to quench the current and will restore um, the previous uh, restore the MPPC to its previous state, so it's able to detect multiple events. Once the signal is produced, it will be uh, shifted, transmitted to the front end board. The front end board is a device that is able to amplify and digitize the signal that uh, received from the SIPM. Some of the functions are here, amplifies and performs shaping of MPPC at the connect channel, performs digitization of signal amplitude of 32 channels, and provides basic coincidence of signals from each pair of adjacent channels. So as you can see here, this is the Ethernet port because the front end board is interfaced with the computer through the Ethernet port. And what you can see here is the inputs of the system. I have a better picture that shows the whole setup. So we have the arc light here. These are the connections, the wiring from the system that goes way, goes up until it's connected to the front end board, which then 
uh, transported data through the Ethernet port to your computer. So this is uh, this is sort of the scheme of all the procedure we have to go through to make sure that the data collection of light is actually accurate. Angela and I particularly worked on the data collection and analysis. So we made sure that all the diodes are worth functioning for all systems. We then created a baseline for all systems. That is a very important uh, step, meaning we have to make sure that every system work at the same by work at the same bias voltage. Then we collected data all for all systems in two different conditions, light and dark conditions. Dark condition meaning we actually turn the light off inside the lab room. And light condition, light condition, we turn on an LED, an LED driver so that we could actually ensure a light source. That was all wasn't it? Uh, <laughs> a light source, uh, other light source. Um, then yeah, we collect we we did all the step and repeat all the step by increasing the bias voltage by 0.1 volts. So the results was me being able, being a medical student, to plot a graph and fit a Lorentzian curve in it. So what we can see here, well, we so well you can see you only see here displayed channel three, but I went through the whole channel and decided to show the channel that detected the most events with the clearest curves. So what you can see here is um, a graph from an 86 channel, and you, what you can see here are four different curves. The first curve is called the pedestal, which only highlights electrical noise, and then you can see this the second curve, that current foot curve. This curve is very important because they highlight uh, the emission of photoelectrons. Photoelectrons are the result of the photoelectric effect, which is basically the ability of certain material, we're talking about metals, to emit a photoelectrons once they absorb enough light. So this is the graph that I plotted. We can find the peak center at 21, uh, 228, 350, 462, and 571. So this is a bit of the data analysis and curvature code that I wrote, thanks to the help of Domenico and Angela. So the way it works, we get an output file from the, from the software connected to the front end board. I created a file path and then created arrays using SciPy and, uh, and NumPy for all the different channels. Once, once all the arrays were created, I plotted both on Instagram and defined a Laurentian, curve, um, a Laurentian function with four different curves so that it could fit the actual histogram. So this is a bit of a summary of what I learned from the experience. I learned to do basics of pipe encoding, data collection analysis, graphs plotting and curve splitting using and access and use of uh, Python libraries as in matplotlib, scipy, numpy, and yeah, uh, and of course physics. So neutrino <laughs> interaction, sense selection, and light detection. So as for the acknowledgement, I'd like to thank Professor Anatasa and of course Bonnie Fleming for welcoming into the lab. And you know, as a foundation for giving me the amazing opportunity to be here, Domenico for welcoming into the lab and Matt and Angela for showing me the amazing possibility of lab teamwork. And also Hoshi, who's certainly not here because he went back to California, and the University of Program students, thank you for making this experience one of the most unforgettable parts of my life. Well, you also did a great job despite your supervisor. <laughs> well, that was, that was very good. Uh, you should correct a little bit your British accent, which is... Right, <laughs> too British, right, yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. And, uh, well, time for questions. I think we are... I understand. Was that clear? Amazing. Yes. <laughs> no, so re really, really nice stuff. So, so that system data you showed nice peaks with photoelectrons, was that taken cold or were you able to get that? Couldn't tell if your box was cooled or not. Uh, was that at room temperature or were you cooling? Well, the, the RTDs. Well, yeah, so this, I guess, wooden box on the right, is that where the... Oh, wait, here? Yeah. Well, well... So are you cooling down the SIPMs when you take, or the MPPCs when you take that data? Uh, well, we didn't, I didn't think we cooled them down. We just, we just performed all the data collection both in light and with no light, but uh -huh. yeah. Okay. Maybe one more? Okay. Good. Thank you for your Thank attention. you.